This poem by Henry Van Dyke is a very important one in our opinion because it carries a tremendous radiation. Henry Van Dyke was a magnificent man of the spirit and you will see that as we attempt this reading. We do it in the name of the Ascended Master, St. Germain. It is called The Other Wise Men. I'm sorry, I should have said The Other Wise Man. You know the story of the three wise men of the East and how they traveled from far away to offer their gifts at the manger cradle in Bethlehem. But have you ever heard the story of the other wise man who also saw the star in its rising and set out to follow it, yet did not arrive with his brethren in the presence of the young child, Jesus? Of the great desire of this fourth pilgrim and how it was denied yet accomplished in the denial, of his many wanderings and the probations of his soul, of the long way of his seeking and the strange way of his finding, the one whom he sought, I would tell the tale as I have heard fragments of it in the hall of dreams in the palace of the heart of man. In the days when Augustus Caesar was master of many kings and Herod reigned in Jerusalem, there lived in the city of Ekbatana among the mountains of Persia, a certain man named Artaban. His house stood close to the outermost of the walls which encircled the royal treasury. From his roof he could look over the sevenfold battlements of black and white and crimson and blue and red and silver and gold to the hill where the summer palace of the Parthian emperors glittered like a jewel in a crown. Around the dwelling of Artaban spread a fair garden, a tangle of flowers and fruit trees watered by a score of streams descending from the slopes of Mount Orontes and made musical by innumerable birds. But all color was lost in the soft and odorous darkness of the late September night, and all sounds were hushed in the deep charm of its silence, save the plashing of the water, like a voice half sobbing and half laughing under the shadows. High above the trees, a dim glow of light shone through the curtained arches of the upper chamber, where the master of the house was holding counsel with his friends. He stood by the doorway to greet his guests. A tall, dark man of about 40 years with brilliant eyes set near together under his broad brow and firm lines graven around his fine, thin lips. The brow of a dreamer and the mouth of a soldier, a man of sensitive feeling but inflexible will, one of those who in whatever age they may live are born for inward conflict and a life of quest. His robe was a pure white wool thrown over a tunic of silk and a white pointed cap with long lapels at the sides rested on his flowing black hair. It was the dress of the ancient priesthood of the Magi called the fire worshippers. Welcome, he said in his low, pleasant voice, as one after another entered the room. Welcome, Abdus, peace be with you. Rhodopses, Antigrenes, and with you, my father, Abgarus, you are all welcome. This house grows bright with the joy of your presence. There were nine of the men, differing widely in ages, but alike in the richness of their dress of many colored silks and in the massive golden collars around their necks, marking them as Parthian nobles, and in the winged circles of gold resting upon their breasts, the sign of the followers of Zoroaster. They took their places around a small black altar at the end of the room where a tiny flame was burning. Artaban, standing beside it and waving a barsom, of thin tamarisk branches above the fire, fed it with dry sticks of pine and fragrant oils. Then he began the ancient chant of the Yasna, and the voices of his companions joined in the hymn to Ahura Mazda. We worship the spirit divine, all wisdom and goodness possessing, surrounded by holy immortals, the givers of bounty and blessing. We joy in the work of his hands, his truth and his power confessing. We praise all the things that are pure, for these are his only creation, the thoughts that are true and the words and the deeds that have won approbation. These are supported by him 
and for these we make adoration. Hear us, O Mazda, thou livest, in truth and in heavenly gladness. Cleanse us from falsehood and keep us from evil and bondage to badness. Pour out the light and the joy of thy life on our darkness and sadness. Shine on our gardens and fields. Shine on our working and weaving. Shine on the whole race of man, believing and unbelieving. Shine on us now through the night. Shine on us now in thy might. The flame of our holy love and the song of our worship receiving. The fire rose with a chant, throbbing as if the flame responded to the music until it cast a bright illumination through the whole apartment, revealing its simplicity and splendor. The floor was laid with tiles of dark blue vein, with white pilasters of twisted silver stood out against the blue walls. The clear story of round arched windows above them was hung with azure silk. The vaulted ceiling was the pavement of blue stones. Like the body of heaven, in its clearness, sewn with silver stars, from the four corners of the roof hung Four golden magic wheels called the tongues of the gods. At the eastern end behind the altar, there were two dark red pillars of periphery. Above them a lintel of the same stone in which was carved the figure of a winged archer with his arrow set to the string and his bow drawn. The doorway between the pillars which opened upon the terrace of the roof was covered with a heavy curtain of the color of a ripe pomegranate, embroidered with innumerable golden rays shooting upward from the floor. In effect, the room was like a quiet starry night all azure and silver flushed in the east with rosy promise of the dawn. It was as the house of a man should be, an expression of the character and spirit of the master. He turned to his friends when the song was ended and invited them to be seated on the divan at the western end of the room. You have come tonight, he said, at my call as the faithful scholars of Zoroaster to renew your worship and rekindle your faith in the God of purity, even as this fire has been rekindled on the altar. We worship not the fire, but him of whom it is the chosen symbol, because it is the purest of all created things. It speaks to us of one who is light and truth. Is it not so, my father? It is well said, my son, answered the venerable Abgarus. The enlightened are never idolaters. They lift the veil of form and go on to the shrine of reality, and new light and truth are come, coming to them continually through the old symbols. Hear, hear me then, my father and my friends, said Artaban, while I tell you of the new light and truth that have come to me through the most ancient of all signs. We have searched the secrets of nature together and studied the healing virtues of water and the fire and the plants. We have read also the books of prophecy in which the future is dimly foretold in words that are hard to understand. But the highest of all learning is the knowledge of the stars. To trace their course is to untangle the threads of the mystery of life from the beginning to the end. If we could follow them perfectly, nothing would be hidden from us. But is not our knowledge of them still incomplete? Are there not many stars still beyond our horizon, lights that are known only to the dwellers in the far southland among the spice trees of Punt and the gold mines of Ophir? There was a murmur of assent among the listeners. The stars, said Tigranus, are the thoughts of the eternal. They are numberless. But the thoughts of man can be counted like the years of his life. The wisdom of the Magi is the greatest of all wisdom on earth because it knows its own ignorance. And that is the secret of power. We keep men always looking and waiting for a new sunrise. But we ourselves understand that the darkness is equal to the light and that the conflict between them will never be ended. That does not satisfy me, answered Artaban. For if the waiting must be endless, if there could be no fulfillment of it, then it would not be wisdom to look and wait. We should become like those new teachers of the Greeks who say that there is no truth and that the only wise men are those who spend their lives in discovering and exposing the lies that have been believed in the world. But the new sunrise will certainly appear in the appointed time. Do not our own books tell us that this will come to pass and that men will see the brightness of a great light? That is true, said the voice of Abdars. Every faithful disciple of Zoroaster knows the prophecy of the Avesta, and carries the word in his heart. In this day, Sosiosh the victorious shall arise out of the number of the prophets in the east country. Around him shall shine a mighty brightness, and he shall make life everlasting, incorruptible, and immortal, and the dead shall rise again. This is a dark saying, said Tigranus, and it may be that we shall never understand it. 
It is better to consider the things that are near at hand and to increase the influence of the Magi in their own country rather than to look for one who may be a stranger and to whom we must resign our power. The others seemed to approve these words. There was a silent feeling of agreement manifest among them. Their looks responded with that indefinable expression which always follow when a speaker has uttered the thought that has been slumbering in the hearts of his listeners. But Artaban turned to Abdaris with a glow on his face and said, My father, I have kept this prophecy in the secret place of my soul. Religion without a great hope would be like an altar without a living fire. And now the flame has burned more brightly, and by the light of it I have read other words which also have come from the fountain of truth and speak yet more clearly of the rising of the victorious one in his brightness. He drew from his breast the breast of his tunic two small rolls of fine parchment with writing upon them and unfolded them carefully upon his knee. In the years that are lost in the past, long before our fathers came into the land of Babylon, there were wise men in Chaldea, from whom the first of the Magi learned the secret of the heavens, and of these Balaam, the son of Beor, was one of the mightiest. Hear the words of his prophecy. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. The lips of Tigranus grew downward with contempt as he said, Judah was a captive by the waters of Babylon, and the sons of Jacob were in bondage to our kings. The tribes of Israel are scattered through the mountains like lost sheep, and from the remnant that dwell in Judea under the yoke of Rome, neither star nor scepter shall rise. And yet, answered Artaban, it was the Hebrew Daniel, the mighty searcher of dreams, the counselor of kings, the wise Belshazzar, who was most honored and beloved of our great King Cyrus, a prophet of sure things and a reader of the thoughts of the eternal. Daniel proved himself to our people, and these are the words that he wrote. Artaban read from the second scroll. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore Jerusalem under the anointed one, the prince, the time shall be seven and threescore and two weeks. But my son, said Abgarus doubtfully, these are mystical numbers. Who can interpret them or who can find the key that shall unlock their meaning? Artaban answered, it has been shown to me and to my three companions among the Magi, Caspar, Melchior, and Belshazzar. We have searched the ancient tablets of Chaldea and computed the time. It falls in this year. We have studied the sky, and in the spring of the year we saw two of the greatest planets draw near together in the sign of the fish, which is the house of the Hebrews. We also saw a new star there, which shone for one night and then vanished. Now again, the two great planets are meeting. This night is their conjunction. My three brothers are watching by the ancient temple of the seven spheres at Borsippa in Babylonia, and I am watching here. If the star shines again, they will wait ten days for me at the temple, and then we shall set out together for Jerusalem to see and worship the promised one who shall be born king of Israel. I believe the sign will come. I have made ready for the journey. I have sold my possessions and bought these three jewels, a sapphire, a ruby, and a pearl to carry them as tribute to the king. And I ask you to go with me on the pilgrimage, that we may have joy together in finding the prince who is worthy to be served. While he was speaking, he thrust his hand into the inmost fold of his girdle and drew out three great gems, one blue as a fragment of the night sky, one redder than a ray of sunrise, and one as pure as the peak of a snow mountain at twilight, and laid them on the outspread scrolls before them. But his friends looked on with strange and alien eyes. A veil of doubt and mistrust came over their faces like a fog creeping up from the marshes to hide the hills. They glanced at each other with looks of wonder and pity as those who have listened to incredible sayings in the story of a wild vision of the proposal of an impossible enterprise. At last Tigranus said, Artaban, this is a vain dream. It comes from too much looking upon the stars and the cherishing of lofty thoughts. It would be wiser to spend the time in gathering money for the new fire temple at Chela. No king will ever arise from the broken race of Israel, and no end will ever come to the eternal strife of light and darkness. He who looks for it is a chaser of shadows. Farewell. Another said, Artaban, I have no knowledge of these things, and my office as guardian of the royal treasure binds me here. The quest is not for me, but if thou must follow it, fare thee well. And another said, in my house there sleeps a new bride, and I cannot leave her nor take her with me on this strange journey. This 
quest is not for me, but may thy steps pro be prospered wherever thou goest. So farewell. And another said, I am ill and unfit for hardship, but there is a man among my servants whom I will send with thee when thou goest to bring me word how thou farest. So one by one they left the house of Artaban, but Abgarus, the oldest and the one who loved him the best, lingered after the others had gone and said gravely, My son, it may be that the light of truth is in this sign that has appeared in the skies, and it will surely lead to the prince and the mighty brightness. Or it may be that it is only shadow of the light, as Tigranus has said, and then he who follows it will have a long pilgrimage and a fruitless search. But it is better to follow even the shadow of the best than to remain content with the worst. And those who would see wonderful things must often be ready to travel alone. I am too old for this journey, but my heart shall be a companion of thy pilgrimage, day and night, and I shall know the end of thy quest. Go in peace. Then Abgarus went out of the azure chamber with its silver stars, and Artaban was left in solitude. He gathered up the jewels and replaced them in his girdle. For a long time he stood and watched the flame that flickered and sank upon the altar. Then he crossed the hall, lifted the heavy curtain, and passed out between the pillars a periphery to the terrace on the roof. The shiver that runs through the earth ere she rouses from her night's sleep had already begun, and the cool wind that heralds the daybreak was drawing downward from the lofty snow-traced ravines of Mount Orontes. Birds half awakened crept and chirped among the rustling leaves, and the smell of ripened grapes came in brief wafts from the arbors. Far over the eastern plain a white mist stretched like a lake, but where the distant peaks of Zagros serrated the western horizon, the sky was clear. Jupiter and Saturn rolled together like drops of lambent flame about to blend into one. As Artaban watched them, a steel-blue spark was born out of the darkness beneath, rounding itself with purple splendors, purple splendors to a crimson sphere and spiring upward through rays of saffron and orange into a point of white radiance. Tiny and infinitely remote, yet perfect in every part, it pulsated in the enormous vault, as if the three jewels in the Magian's girdle had mingled and been transformed into a living heart of light. He bowed his head. He covered his brow with his hands. It is the sign, he said. The king is coming, and I will go to meet him. All night long, Vazda, the swiftest of Artaban's horses, had been waiting, saddled and bridled in her stall, pawing the ground impatiently and shaking her bit as if she shared the eagerness of her master's purpose, though she knew not its meaning. Before the birds had fully roused to their strong, high, joyful chant of morning song, before the white mist had begun to lift lazily from the plain, the other wise man was in the saddle, riding swiftly along the high road which skirted the base of Mount Orontes westward. How close, how intimate is the comradeship between a man and his favorite horse on a long journey. It is a silent, comprehensive <laughs> friendship an intercourse beyond the need of words. They drink at the same wayside springs and sleep under the same guardian stars. They are conscious together of the subduing spell of nightfall and the quickening joy of daybreak. The master shares his evening meal with his hungry companion and feels the soft, moist lips caressing the palm of his hand as they close over the morsel of bread. In the gray dawn, he is roused from his bivouac by the gentle stir of a warm, sweet breath over his sleeping face and looks up into the eyes of his faithful fellow traveler, ready and waiting for the toil of the day. Surely unless he is a pagan and an unbeliever, by whatever name he calls upon his God, he will thank him for this voiceless symphony, sympathy, this dumb affection, and his morning prayer will embrace a double blessing. God bless us both, the horse and the rider, and keep our feet from falling and our souls from death. Then through the keen morning air, the swift hoofs beat their tattoo along the road, keeping time to the pulsing of two hearts that are moved with the same eager desire to conquer space, to devour the distance, to attain the goal of the journey. Artaban must indeed ride wisely and well if he would keep the appointed hour with the other magi, for the route was a hundred and fifty parsangs, and fifteen was the utmost that he could travel in a day. But he knew Vazda's strength and pushed forward without anxiety, making the fixed distance every day, though he must travel late into the night and in the morning long before sunrise. He passed along the brown slopes of Mount Orontes, furrowed by the rocky courses of a hundred torrents. He crossed the level plains of the Nissians, where the famous herds of horses feeding in the wide pastures tossed their heads at Vazda's approach and galloped away with a thunder of many hoofs. And flocks of wild birds rose suddenly from the swampy meadows, wheeling in great circles with a shining flutter of innumerable wings and shrill cries of surprise. He traversed the fertile fields of Konkabar, where the dust from the threshing floors filled the air with a golden mist half hiding the huge temple of Astarte with its 400 pillars. 
At Boggistan, among the rich gardens, watered by fountains from the rock, he looked up at the mountains, thrusting its immense rugged brow out over the road, and saw the figure of King Darius trampling upon his fallen foes and the proud list of his wars and conquests, graven high upon the face of the eternal cliff. Over many a cold and desolate pass, crawling painfully across the windswept shoulders of the hill, down many a black mountain gorge where the river roared and raced before him like a savage guide, across many a smiling vale with terraces of yellow limestone full of vines and fruit trees, through the oak groves of Karin and the dark gates of Zagros walled in by precipices, into the ancient city of Chala, where the people of Samaria had been kept in captivity long ago, and out again by the mighty portal riven through the circling hills where he saw the image of the high priest of the Magi sculptured on the wall of rock with hand uplifted as if to bless the centuries of pilgrims past the entrance of the narrow defile, filled from end to end with orchards of peaches and figs through which the river Gindes foamed down to meet him over the broad rice fields where the autumnal vapors spread their deathly mists, following along the courses of the river under tremulous shadows of poplar and tamarind among the lower hills and out upon the flat plain where the road ran straight as an arrow through the stubble fields and parched meadows past the city of Tessiphon, where the Parthian emperors reigned in the vast metropolis of Seleucia, which Alexander built across the swirling floods of Tigris and the many channels of Euphrates, flowing yellow through the cornlands, Artaban pressed. Onward, till he arrived at nightfall on the tenth day beneath the shattered walls of populous Babylon. Vazda was almost spent, and Artaban would gladly have turned into the city to find rest and refreshment for himself and for her. But he knew that it was three hours' journey yet to the temple of the seven spheres, and he must reach the place by midnight if he would find his comrades waiting. So he did not halt but rode steadily across the stubble fields. A grove of date palms made an island of gloom in the pale yellow sea. As she passed into the shadow, Vazda slackened her pace and began to pick her way more carefully. Near the farther end of the darkness, an access of caution seemed to fall upon her. She scented some danger or difficulty. It was not in her heart to fly from it, only to be prepared for it, and to meet it wisely as a good horse should do. The grove was close and silent as the tomb. Not a leaf rustled, not a bird sang. She felt her steps before her delicately, carrying her head low and sighing now and then with apprehension. At last she gave a quick breath of anxiety and dismay and stood stock still, quivering in every muscle before a dark object in the shadow of the last palm tree. Artaban dismounted. The dim starlight revealed the form of a man lying across the road. His humble dress and the outline of his haggard face showed that he was probably one of the Hebrews who still dwelt in great numbers around the city. His pallid skin, dry and yellow as parchment, bore the mark of the deadly fever which ravaged the marshlands in autumn. The chill of death was in his lean hand, and as Artaban released it, the arm fell back inertly upon the motionless breast. He turned away with a thought of pity, leaving the body to that strange burial which the Magians deemed most fitting, the funeral of the desert, from which the kites and the vultures rise on dark wings and the breasts of prey slink furtively away. When they are gone, there is only a heap of white bones in the sand. But as he turned, a long, faint, ghostly sigh came from the man's lips. The bony fingers gripped the hem of the Magian's robe and held him fast. Artaban's heart leaped to his throat, not with fear, but with a dumb resentment at the importunity of this blind delay. How could he stay here in the darkness to minister to a dying stranger? What claim had this unknown fragment of human life upon his compassion or his service? If he lingered but for an hour, he could hardly reach Borsippa at the appointed time. His companions would think he had given up the journey. They would go without him. He would lose his quest. But if he went on now, the man would surely die. If Artaban stayed, life might be restored. His spirit throbbed and fluttered with the urgency of the crisis. Should he risk the great reward of his faith for the sake of a single deed of charity? Should he turn aside, if only for a moment, from the following of the star to give a cup of cold water to a poor perishing Hebrew? God of truth and purity, he prayed, direct me in the holy path, the way of wisdom which thou only knowest. Then he turned back to the sick man. Loosening the grasp of his hand, he carried him to a little mound at the foot of the palm tree. He unbound the thick folds of a turban and opened the garment above the sunken breast. He brought water from one of the small canals nearby and moistened the sufferer's brow and mouth. He mingled the draught of one of those simple but potent remedies which he carried always in his girdle. For the Magians were physicians, 
as well as astrologers, and poured it slowly between the colorless lips. Hour after hour he labored as only a skillful healer of disease can do. At last the man's strength returned, and he sat up and looked about him. Who art thou? he said in the rude dialect of the country, and why hast thou sought me here to bring back my life? I am Artaban, the Magi Magian of the city of Ectabatana, and I'm going to Jerusalem in search of one who is to be born king of the Jews, a great prince and deliverer of all men. I dare not delay any longer upon my journey, for the caravan that is waited for me may depart without me. But see, here is all that I have left of bread and wine, and here is a potion of healing herbs. When thy strength is restored, thou canst find the dwellings of the Hebrews among the houses of Babylon. The Jew raised his trembling hand solemnly to heaven. Now may the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob bless and prosper the journey of the merciful and bring him in peace to his desired haven. Stay, I have nothing to give thee in return, only this, that I can tell thee where the Messiah must be sought. For our prophets have said, that he should be born not in Jerusalem, but in Bethlehem of Judah. May the Lord bring thee in safety to that place, because thou hast had pity upon the sick. It was already long past midnight. Artaban rode in haste, and Vazda, restored by the brief rest, ran eagerly through the silent plain and swam the channels of the river. She put forth the remnant of her strength and fled over the ground like a gazelle. But the first beam of the rising sun sent a long shadow before her as she entered upon the final stadium of the journey, and the eyes of Artaban anxiously scanning the great mound of Nimrod and the Temple of the Seven Spheres could discern no trace of his friends. The many-colored terraces of black and orange and red and yellow and green and blue and white, shattered by the convulsions of nature and crumbling under the repeated blows of human violence, still glittered like a ruined rainbow in the morning light. Artaban rode swiftly around the hill. He dismounted and climbed to the highest terrace, Looking out toward the west, the huge desolation of the marshes stretched away to the horizon and the border of the desert. Bittern stood by the stagnant pools, and jackals skulked through the low bushes, but there was no sign of the caravan of the wise men, far or near. At the edge of the terrace he saw a little cairn of broken bricks, and under them a piece of papyrus. He caught it up and read, We have waited past the midnight, and can delay no longer. We go to find the king. Follow us across the desert. Artaban sat down upon the ground and covered his head in despair. How can I cross the desert, he said, with no food and with a spent horse? I must return to Babylon, sell my sapphire and buy a train of camels and provision for the journey. I may never overtake my friends. Only God the merciful knows whether I shall not lose the sight of the king because I tarried to show mercy. There was a silence in the Hall of Dreams where I was listening to the story of the other wise man. Through this silence I saw but very dimly his figure passing over the dreary undulations of the desert high up on the back of his camel, rocking steadily onward like a ship over the waves. The land of death spread its cruel net around him. The stony waste bore no fruit but briars and thorns. The dark ledges of rock thrust themselves above the surface here and there like the bones of perished monsters. Arid and inhospitable mountain ranges rose before him, furrowed with dry channels of ancient torrents, white and ghastly as scars on the face of nature. Shifting hills of treacherous sand were heaped like tombs along the horizon. By day, the fierce heat pressed its intolerable burden on the quivering air. No living creature moved on the dumb, swooning earth, but tiny jerboas scuttling through the parched bushes or lizards vanishing in the clefts of the rock. By night the jackals prowled and barked in the distance, and the lion made the black ravines echo with his hollow roaring, while a bitter, blighting chill followed the fever of the day. Through heat and cold the Magian moved steadily onward. Then I saw the gardens and orchards of Damascus, watered by the streams of Abana with Parfar, with their sloping swards inlaid with bloom and their thickets of myrrh and roses. I saw the long snowy ridge of Hermon and the dark groves of cedars and the valley of the Jordan and the blue waters of the Lake of Galilee and the fertile plains of Israelim and the hills of Ephraim and the highlands of Judah. Through all these I followed the figure of Artaman, moving steadily onward until he arrived at Bethlehem. And it was the third day after the wise men had come to that place and had found Mary and Joseph with the young child Jesus and had laid their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh at his feet. Then the other wise man drew near, weary but full of hope, 
bearing his ruby and his pearl to offer to the king. For now at last, he said, I shall surely find him, though I be alone and later than my brethren. This is the place of which the Hebrew exile told me that the prophets had spoken. And here I shall behold the rising of the great light. But I must inquire about the visit of my brethren and to what house the star directed them and to whom they presented their tribute. The streets of the village seemed to be deserted. And Artaban wondered whether the man had all whether the men had all gone up to the hill pastures to bring down their sheep. From the open door of the cottage, he heard the sound of a woman's voice singing softly. He entered and found a young mother hushing her baby to rest. She told him of the strangers from the far east who had appeared in the village three days ago and how they said that a star had guided them to the place where Joseph of Nazareth was lodging with his wife and her newborn child and how they had paid reverence to the child and given him many rich gifts. But the travelers disappeared again, she continued, as suddenly as they had come. We were afraid at the strangeness of their visit. We could not understand it. The man of Nazareth took the child and his mother and fled away that same night secretly, and it was whispered that they were going to Egypt. Ever since, there has been a spell upon the village. Something evil hangs over it. They say that the Roman soldiers are coming from Jerusalem to force a new tax from us, and the men have driven the flocks and herds far back among the hills and hidden themselves to escape it. Artaban listened to her gentle, timid speech, and the child in her arms looked up in his face and smiled, stretching out its rosy hands to grasp at the winged circle of gold on his breast. His heart warmed to the touch. It seemed like a greeting of love and trust to one who had journeyed long in loneliness and perplexity, fighting with his own doubts and fears and following a light that was veiled in clouds. Why might not this child have been the promised prince, he asked himself, as he touched its soft cheek. Kings have been born ere now in lowlier houses than this, and the favorite of the stars may rise even from a cottage. But it has not seemed good to the God of wisdom to reward my search so soon and so easily. The woman whom I seek is gone before me, and now I must follow the king to Egypt. The young mother laid the baby in its cradle and rose to minister to the wants of the strange guest that fate had brought into her house. She set food before him, the plain fare of peasants, but willingly offered and therefore full of refreshment for the soul as well as for the body. Artaban accepted it gratefully, and as he ate, the child fell into a happy slumber and murmured sweetly in its dreams, and a great peace filled the room. But suddenly there came the noise of a wild confusion in the streets of the village, a shrieking and wailing of women's voices, a clangor of brazen trumpets and a clashing of swords, and a desperate cry, The soldiers, the soldiers of Herod, they are killing our children! The young mother's face grew white with terror. She clasped her child to her bosom and crouched motionless in the darkest corner of the room, covering him with the folds of her robe, lest he should awake and cry. But Artaban went quickly and stood in the doorway of the house. His broad shoulders filled the portal from side to side, and the peak of his white cap all but touched the lintel. The soldiers came hurrying down the street with bloody hands and dripping swords. At the sight of the stranger in his imposing dress, they hesitated with surprise. The captain of the band approached the threshold to thrust him aside but Artaban did not stir. His face was as calm as though he were watching the stars, and in his eyes there burned that steady radiance before which even the half-tamed hunting leopard shrinks and the bloodhound pauses in his leap. He held the soldier silently for an instant and then said in a low voice, I am all alone in this place, and I am waiting to give this jewel to the prudent captain who will leave me in peace. He showed the ruby, glistening in the hollow of his hand like a great drop of blood. The captain was amazed at the splendor of the gem. The pupils of his eyes expanded with desire, and the hard lines of greed wrinkled around his lips. He stretched out his hand and took the ruby. March on, he cried to his men. There is no child here. The house is empty. The clamor and the clang of arms passed down the street as the headlong fury of the chase sweeps by the secret covert where the trembling deer is hidden. Artaban re-entered the cottage. He turned his face to the east and prayed, God of truth, forgive my sin. I have said the thing that is not to save the life of a child, and two of my gifts are gone. I have spent for man that which was meant for God. Shall I ever be worthy to see the face of the king? But the voice of the woman, weeping for joy in the shadow behind him, said very gently, Because thou hast saved the life of my little one, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Again there was a silence in the hall of dreams, deeper 
and more mysterious in the first interval, and I understood that the years of Artemon were flowing very swiftly under the stillness, and I caught only a glimpse here and there of the river of his life shining through the mist that concealed its course. I saw him moving among the throngs of men in populous Egypt, seeking everywhere for traces of the household that had come from Bethlehem, and finding them under the spreading sycamore trees of Heliopolis and beneath the walls of the Roman fortress of New Babylon beside the Nile traces so faint and dim that they vanish before him continually as footprints on the wet river sand, glisten for a moment with moisture and then disappear. I saw him again at the foot of the pyramids, which lifted their sharp points into the intense saffron glow of the sunset sky, changeless monuments of the perishable glory and the imperishable hope of man. He looked up into the face of the crouching sphinx and vainly tried to read the meaning of the calm eyes and smiling mouth was it indeed the mockery of all effort and all aspiration, as Tigranius had said, the cruel jest of a riddle that has no answer, a search that never can succeed? Or was there a touch of pity and encouragement in that inscrutable smile, a promise that even the defeated should attain a victory, and the disappointed should discover a prize, and the ignorant should be made wise, and the blind should see, and the wandering should come into the haven at last? I saw him again, in an obscure house of Alexandria, taking counsel with a Hebrew rabbi, the venerable man bending over the rolls of parchment on which the prophecies of Israel were written, read aloud the pathetic word which foretold the suffering of the promised Messiah, the despised and rejected of men, the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And remember, my son, said he, fixing his eyes upon the face of Artaman, the king whom thou seekest is not to be found in a palace, nor among the rich and powerful. If the light of the world and the glory of Israel had been appointed to come with the greatness of earthly splendor, it must have appeared long ago. For no son of Abraham will ever again rival the power which Joseph had in the palaces of Egypt or the magnificence of Solomon thrown between the lions in Jerusalem. But the light for which the world is waiting is a new light. The glory that shall arise out of patient and triumphant suffering, and the kingdom which is to be established forever is a new kingdom, the royalty of unconquerable love. I do not know how this shall come to pass, nor how the turbulent kings and the peoples of earth shall be brought to acknowledge the Messiah and pay homage to him, but this I know, those who seek him will do well to look among the poor and the lowly, the sorrowful and the oppressed. So I saw the other wise man again and again traveling from place to place and searching among the people of the dispersion with whom the little family from Bethlehem might perhaps have found a refuge. He passed through countries where famine lay heavy upon his land and the poor were crying for bread. He made his dwelling in plague-stricken cities where the sick were languishing in the bitter companionship of helpless misery. He visited the oppressed and the afflicted in the gloom of subterranean prisons and the crowded wretchednesses of slave markets and the weary toil of galley ships. In all this populous and intricate world of anxiety, though he found none to worship, he found many to help. He fed the hungry and he clothed the naked and healed the sick and comforted the captive and his years passed more swiftly than the weaver's shuttle that flashes back and forth through the loom while the web grows and the pattern is completed. It seemed almost as if he had forgotten his quest. But once I saw him for a moment as he stood alone at sunrise waiting at the gate of a Roman prison. He had taken from a secret resting place in his bosom, the pearl, the last of his jewels. As he looked at it, a mellower luster, a soft and iridescent light full of shifting gleams of azure and rose trembled upon its surface. It seemed to have absorbed some reflection of the lost sapphire and ruby. He had often visited the holy city before and had searched all its lanes and crowded hovels and black prisons without finding any trace of the family of Nazarenes who had fled from Bethlehem long ago. But now it seemed as if he must make one more effort and something whispered in his heart that at last he might succeed. It was the season of the Passover. The city was thronged with strangers. The children of Israel scattered in far lands had returned to the temple for the great feast and there had been a confusion of tongues in the narrow street for many days. But on this day a singular agitation was visible in the multitude. The sky was veiled with a portentous gloom. Currents of excitement seemed to flash through the crowd a secret tide was sweeping them all one way. The clatter of sandals and the soft, thick sound of thousands of bare feet 
shuffling over the stones, flowed unceasingly along the streets that led to the Damascus Gate. Artaban joined a group of people from his own country, Parthian Jews who had come up to keep the Passover and inquired of them the cause of the tumult and where they were going. We are going, they answered, to the place called Golgotha, outside the city walls where there is to be an execution. Have you not heard what has happened? Two famous robbers are to be crucified and with them another called Jesus of Nazareth, a man who has done many wonderful works among the people so that they love him greatly. But the priests and elders have said that he must die because he gave himself out to be the son of God. And Pilate has sent him to the cross because he said that he was the king of the Jew. How strangely these familiar words fell upon the tired heart of Artaban. They had led him for a lifetime over land and sea. And now they came to him mysteriously like a message of despair. The king had arisen, but he had been denied and cast out. He was about to perish. Perhaps he was already dying. Could it be the same one? who had been born in Bethlehem 33 years ago, at whose birth the star had appeared in heaven, and of whose coming the prophets had spoken? Artaban's heart beat unsteadily with that troubled, doubtful apprehension which is the excitement of old age. But he said within himself, the ways of God are stranger than the thoughts of men, and it may be that I shall find the king at last in the hand of his enemies and shall come in time to offer my pearl for his ransom before he dies. So the old man followed the multitude with slow and painful steps toward the Damascus gate of the city. Just beyond the entrance of the guardhouse, a troop of Macedonian soldiers came down the street dragging a young girl with torn dress and disheveled hair. As the Magian paused to look at her with compassion, she broke suddenly from the hands of her tormentors and threw herself at his feet, clasping him around the knees. She had seen his white cap and the winged circle on his breast. Have pity on me, she cried, and save me for the sake of the God of purity. I also am a daughter of the true religion which is taught by the Magi. My father was a merchant of Parthia, but he is dead, and I am seized for his debts to be sold as a slave. Save me from worse than death. Artaban trembled. It was the old conflict in his soul which had come to him in the palm grove of Babylon and in the cottage at Bethlehem, the conflict between the expectation of faith and the impulse of love. Twice the gift which he had consecrated to the worship of religion had been drawn to the service of humanity. This was the third trial, the ultimate probation, the final and irrevocable choice. Was it his great opportunity or his last temptation? He could not tell. One thing only was clear in the darkness of his mind. It was inevitable. And does not the inevitable come from God? One thing only was sure to his divided heart. To rescue this helpless girl would be a true deed of love. And is not the light, is not love the light of the soul? He took the pearl from his bosom. Never had it seemed so luminous so radiant, so full of tender living luster. He laid it in the hand of the slave. This is thy ransom, daughter. It is the last of my treasures, which I kept for the king. While he spoke, the darkness of the sky deepened and the shuddering tremors ran through the earth, heaving convulsive like the breast of one who struggles in mighty grief. The walls of the houses rocked to and fro, stones were loosened and crashed into the streets, Dust clouds filled the air. The soldiers fled in terror, reeling like drunken men. But Artaban and the girl whom he had ransomed crouched helpless beneath the wall of the praetorium. What had he to fear? What had he to hope? He had given away the last remnant of his tribute for the king. He had parted with the last hope of finding him. The quest was over, and it had failed. But even in that thought, accepted and embraced, there was peace. It was not resignation. It was not submission. It was something more profound in searching. He knew that all was well because he had done the best that he could from day to day. He had been true to the light that had been given to him. He had looked for more. And if he had not found it, if failure was all that come out of his life, doubtless there was, that was the best that was possible. He had not seen the revelation of life everlasting, incorruptible and immortal. But he knew that even if he could live his earthly life over again, it could not be otherwise than it had been. One more lingering pulsation of the earthquake quivered through the ground. A heavy tile shaken from the roof struck, fell and struck the old man in the temple. He lay breathless and pale with his gray head resting on the young girl's shoulder and the blood trickling from the wound. As she bent over him, fearing that he was dead, there came a voice through the twilight, very small and still, like music sounding from a distance. 
in which the notes are clear, but the words are lost. The girl turned to see if someone had spoken from the window above them, but she saw no one. Then the old man's lips began to move as if in answer. And she heard him say in the Parthian tongue, Not so, my lord. For when saw I thee a hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw I thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? When saw I thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? Three and thirty years have I looked for thee, but I have never seen thy face nor minister to thee, my king. He ceased, and the sweet voice came again. And again the maid heard it, very faint and far away. But now it seemed as though she understood the words. Verily I say unto thee, inasmuch as thou hast done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, Thou hast done it unto me. A calm radiance of wonder and joy lighted the pale face of Artaman, like the first ray of dawn on a snowy mountain peak. A long breath of relief exhaled gently from his lips. His journey was ended. His treasures were accepted. The other wise man had found the king.